this is an idea that I introduced last time. This is kind of uh, one of the ideas that I've been working on for a long time, this difference between instrumental communication and substantive communication. So uh, real quickly, I'm just going to kind of jog your memory about where, about where we left off last week. Uh, I kind, of lay, I kind of laid out the different characteristics of, of what I think are these uh, two fundamentally different modes of, of, of speech or communication, <laughs> two fundamentally different ways of basically you know, relating to other people. Um, and in the one, it's, ex it's all about extrinsic motivation, or in other words, instrumental rationality, which is another word that we talked about last time, uh, where the goal is to kind of strategically get something out of the other person. Um, and it, often it involves, or almost by definition involves, um, you know, delaying the possible immediate experience that you can have with a person in favor of like some other thing that you get down the line. That's a kind of uh, other characteristic of it. And it tends to be cost minimizing. So it's, it's a kind of efficiency attitude. It's a kind of uh, usually, you know, when you're in an instrumental mindset and you're trying to, uh, you know, manipulate the world to get what you want from it, you, it's kind of intrinsically, things are only useful to you uh, to the degree you get something out of them. Therefore, you're not going to be spending your time more than you need to on anything. Okay. Uh, that's basically the instrumental attitude. And you see that in, in speech. Uh, so, Opposed to this, I talked about uh, substantive communication or, um, you know, speech or interaction where the motivation is the actual activity itself. That's what autotelic means, where the goal or telos uh, is the, the very thing that you're doing. And there is no other thing to be gained. You're not trying to get anything out of it. Um, it, in other words, has intrinsic motivation or intrinsic value. Uh, and the, one, of the key one of the other key differences is that when you're communicating with someone substantively, uh, you're really only trying to bring to the surface things that are perhaps not visible uh, at the beginning of the conversation, right? The purpose is to kind of uh, just increase the kind of the truth of the pic of you know, to, how should I put it? Uh, to make your picture of the world uh, increasingly truthful or to uh, make the other person's picture of the world increasingly truthful um, where you're not trying, you're not talking about things or saying things or expressing things to get something, but simply because you have a sense that something is hidden that you want to bring to light because that's intrinsically valuable. Not only is it intrinsically satisfying and enjoyable, that's like what you do on your therapist's couch, right? When you're kind of just uh, telling them about your, you know, your family and your dreams and this, this sort of, this image of uh, kind of therapeutic uh, speech is basically what substantive, that's one kind of popular culture example of what I have in mind when I talk about substantive communication, a form of speaking that is uh, intrinsically rewarding just by doing it. Um, the, and and the, 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 there is something uh, intrinsically effective and satisfying uh, like to your actual body and, and your mind. You're, there's something that actually seems to kind of improve the functioning of your nervous system on some level uh, to simply uh, express something that perhaps has been hidden um, and that by make, you know, by making it clear, by speaking what you really think or speaking what you really feel or sharing experiences that you've had that perhaps have been repressed, there is, there is a real <coughs> phenomenon in which doing that actually has kind of corrective effects on, on your organism. Okay. And that's very weird. I mean, it's very, I, I don't pretend to have a extremely, uh, sophisticated scientific mapping of exactly precisely how all of that works, but it does something like that does seem to be the case. Um, and that's, that's very fascinating. Okay. But that's, that seems to be real. And that's something that, um, that's something that I'm very, in, that's one of the reasons why I'm very interested in this. So, um, substantive communication is in other words about a disinterested revealing. Um, it's imminently enjoyable. Basically I already talked about that and it tends to be cost maximizing. Um, in, in other words, it's the opposite of kind of the, um, the selfish, uh, stingy kind of, uh, attitude towards time you actually want to luxuriously uh, expend energy and resources on what you're doing because it's intrinsically uh, satisfying. So it's like, you know, another example of substantive communication would be like when you're writing and you're actually writing um, something that's really important and real to you. You know, for those of you, when you write essays, this is something to kind of keep in mind. You, obviously some essays have very strict parameters and you can't always write about whatever you want to write about completely. In my module, you can, it's one reason I'm cool. But uh, you, there, you, there is a way to know whether or not you're like 
doing real writing or not. You can usually feel it. And sometimes you have to kind of do what they tell you to do. But even when they tell you what to do, there's always a way in which you can you can respond to people's questions more or less authentically, okay? And so authenticity is a kind of a dirty word nowadays. Like people generally don't believe in authenticity. That's seen as kind of like a passe, uh, old fashioned idea. The kind of contemporary uh, postmodern attitude is that authenticity is bullshit. We're, it's all just a play of surfaces. You know, there's no real true self underneath, you know, your, your, your apparent self. Um, that's a very popular kind of idea to have this kind of cool, you know, detached attitude towards um, the meaninglessness of authenticity. But I deeply and fundamentally disagree with that. I think that authenticity uh, is an absolutely real and important concept. Um, and so why am I talking about this? Well, one, one reason is because you can feel it and it's a, it's a huge uh, kind of uh, uh, determining factor in the actual quality of your life and, and your, the capacities that you're able to cultivate for yourself or not to cultivate. So to go to continue on with this example of writing, this is actually super and immediately concrete uh, and useful, I think, for you, um, because when you're writing something that is real, you can feel it. You can it. It feels like thrilling, a little bit thrilling, a little bit dangerous, in a way. Um, but one of the ways you know you're writing something real is when, like, you're if you work on it for an hour and you walk away from it, you generally feel good about it. You feel good about what you did. You feel like um, the coherence of like your mind or the coherence of your relationship to the world was just in improved. Um, like you went from a state of like relative chaos and kind of uh, confusion or anxiety. And after working on that writing for an hour, you walk away from the desk feeling like that was intrinsically rewarding. Like you were doing good, valuable, important work. If you, if you walk away from writing and you don't feel like that, you're probably not being authentic. You're probably not finding, you know, something real to, to, to try and dig into. And my advice to you would be, you know, keep, you know, keep searching until you can, you know, have that feeling when you walk away from the writing table. Okay, so, so this is just to give you an example of how, uh, what I mean by imminently enjoyable and cost maximizing. Right, so the reason cost maximizing gave me this, this example, this idea for an example is like, when you're writing something that is real and you're, you're, you're authentically trying to work out something that you find intrinsically valuable and important, you actually want to spend more time on it. That's another way that it distinguishes itself. So if you're just trying to get, if you're given an essay prompt and you're just trying to get it done as quickly as you can, every minute of that is going to be painful. And it's like, you're like, um, you're, it's like, you don't want to be there. It's taxing. And you walk away from the writing table feeling like, oh God, that was just, uh, annoying, exhausting, terrible slog. Um, in other words, you want to get it done as quickly as possible. But when you're really expressing yourself authentically or when you're really writing in a way that is about something that you genuinely believe in, where you're genuinely trying to work out something deeper that you are connecting with, when you're doing that authentically, if someone tries to stop, if someone tries to interrupt you or bother you or something else comes up, you get mad at that thing because you don't want to be broken away from it. You want to stay locked in. That's this kind of cost maximizing idea. You want to do it as long as possible when you're in that, when you're in that state. It's also, this is also known as what, what is called a flow state. And there's an actual proper psychology to the flow state. It's something we're going to talk about actually, because it, it's, it's one of the concrete kind of uh, scientific, almost physiological um, correlates to, to what I'm talking about. So, so basically flow states, um, this, this sense of deep authenticity, of doing what is most important to you, of improving your own coherence, of just genuinely feeling better in the activity, of, in the activity itself. Um, these are all telltale signs of what I call substantive communication, okay? Um, and basically the point here is that instrumental communication is, is fundamentally at odds with substantive communication. And in a lot of instances in contemporary life, uh, almost all of the time we're being pressured to be instrumental and it sucks and we feel it and we hate it because it's not real and it's not authentic. Okay. So these are kind of the differences and that's why I'm interested in them. Okay. That basically kind of just, uh, recaps last week and adds, adds kind of some other examples. Um, so let, what I want to talk about now is, uh, this, uh, in this Heidegger text that I had you read. Um, I hope you found it interesting. You probably found it somewhat obscure. I mean, he's a German philosopher for Christ's sake and writing in the middle of the 20th century, uh, has a very kind of, uh, idiosyncratic language. 
Um, so, it, so it was probably somewhat disorienting or perhaps confusing, but that's fine. It should be. That's what you know. Re, that's the value of reading different books. Um, and so, <clears throat> basically, he talks about this idea of the supreme danger, and that's what I one of the things I find most interesting about that that text that I had you read the question concerning technology, uh, because he talks about um, basically, you know, the idea is that modern technology is not just dangerous, but it is the supreme danger. Okay, so what I want to do is kind of try to uh, explain what exactly he meant there and, and talk a little bit about why, you know, I had you read this text. So the first point is that technology is instrumental, but it is also a way of revealing. So obviously, you know, this, a pen is a piece of technology, it's an instrument, right, for doing things like writing. Um, this computer, or whatever, it's an instrument for calculating things, for sending messages. These are in, that's what an instrument is, right? Uh, it's a tool you use to do some other thing. But the deeper point that Heidegger is trying to make is that technology is not just instrumental. It's actually, it imparts its own way of seeing things. Um, and so the idea here is that, you know, when you use a computer to do your calculations and write your write your you know essays and send emails, you're not just using it as a tool. It is basically shaping what it is you're able to even see. It's shaping how you even see things. Okay, so the basic idea is that so for instance, if you use a computer as an instrument to send an email, yes, that's an that's an you're using it as an instrument, but the things that you're using it to interact with don't remain the same as they were before you use them. So it's like when you send an email to someone, the the nature of that person in a sense changes. That person is no longer just a, you know, that, that person is no longer a kind of uh, limitless, mysterious uh, creature, but it's like this thing that you send emails to. In some sense, like other people become objects for your emailing purposes. So it's like, do you see, it, it, it's, a, it's kind of a complicated idea, but it, I hope it's not, it's not too complicated. Um, he gives examples based on uh, natural resources, I think are an, a, a really good example also. So, you know, the earth, the soil of the earth, right? The, you know, the, the layers and layers of different, uh, you know, natural resources in, embedded in, in the earth, things like coal, things like oil, right? Uh, in some sense, the earth itself is this kind of massive, magical, mysterious uh, uh, globe thing, right? This big, massive rock with all these different components and kind of natural, uh, you know, it has this sort of natural makeup. But, to, but for the most part, you know, for all of history, it's a mystery. It's a massive mystery. Um, and what technology does is it, yes, it allows us to do things like extract oil from the ground or, um, you know, extract coal from the ground. But it actually changes the nature of the things that you're trying to, uh, you know, extract or use instrumentally. So, you know, the earth goes from being a kind of, uh, uh, kind of almost mystical uh, mystery to being mere reserves for what we want to do to it okay so this might sound trite but like if you think about think about you know think about the attitude or the worldview of like a pre-modern um peasant you know or think about someone like uh you know genghis khan like genghis khan talked about how the you know the clear blue sky was like uh called him to uh you know unite the mongols and conquer the world that you know there is this sort of like uh, primitive pre-modern relationship to the world or to the earth or you know to the, to our environment if you will in which that environment and everything around us that we live on is uh is like a is like a fundamentally different thing than the way that we think about it we think about all of the earth as just things that we can use so the, heidegger's deeper point here is just that you know this I, this attitude that we have towards the earth and to natural resources it's not at all natural and it's not at all you know uh universal or historically constant it's actually pretty new and it's a product of, of basically modern technology uh before modern technology uh people experience the world in a fundamentally different way and so heidegger is trying to basically uh explain and understand 
what exactly that difference is. And so, um, in some sense, if this seems like weird or kind of goofy or hard to kind of process, in some sense, it's because because technology is is a way of revealing. It actually it actually bars us or prohibits us from understanding or seeing how it could have been. Like in some sense, we are incapable of of really kind of grokking how kind of like pre-technological human beings could experience the earth or, you know, nature or, or the environment or whatever you want to call it. Um, and that's because what we're able to see and how we're able to see it is itself just fundamentally shaped and limited by our technological orientation to the world. So what he's trying to do is he's trying to make this argument and help you see uh, how this works. Um, okay, so one way that he kind of explains this is that technology is uh it's a way of sort of extracting or challenge challenging one's environment to give you what you want and in doing that it uh it brings forth the different aspects of the world uh in a in a particular way so the idea here being that like if you relate to the world poetically if you're a poet for instance um you have a fundamentally different attitude towards uh, the materials of the world. You know, you look out at the world and you, and you try to, through, through something like poetry or different types of artistic performances, you're trying to bring out something in the world uh, in a way that Heidegger calls uh, bringing forth. So that's more like a disinterested revealing, like I was saying before about uh, substantive communication. You're trying to sort of bring out what is hidden in a, in a way that Heidegger calls bringing forth. But technology, when you use technology to manipulate the world, you're not, you're not trying to reveal things in a disinterested way, as with substantive communication. You're trying to, uh, what Heidegger calls challenge forth. Um, you're, you have a kind of antagonistic attitude towards the things that exist, and you're trying to control it or extract it uh, or store it and manipulate it for basically instrumental purposes. Right, so my distinction between this distinction between instrumental and substantive rationality, uh, I, I hope you can see there's an obvious and direct uh, kind of linkage to what Heidegger is trying to say about the nature of modern technology. Okay, um, so in that challenging forth that technology is, it it fundamentally shapes how you see things and how you're able to see things, and as a result of that what happens is that everything in the world has a tendency to become what Heidegger calls standing reserve. Um, and standing reserve is basically this kind of fancy tech technical term for, you know, the perception of things as being on call for your instrumental purposes. And if you think about it, I think this is actually really, um, this is actually really useful and, and pretty deep, I think. And I think it's basically just correct. Uh, this is what modern technology does over time. It leads us to a basic worldview in which we look out at things and for the most part, all we see anywhere is stuff that we can use. Okay, I mean, that certainly seems to be the case with environmental issues, you know, capital E environmental, you know, in the sense of things like, uh, you know, natural resource issues, climate change, that, that whole politics. Um, I think it's pretty clear that, you know, for the most part, we think about things like coal and wind and uh, oil you know, these are just resources there. We, we have a hard time seeing them as anything other than resources for us to use. Um, so I think that that is actually just very accurate and, and useful. But the real the real problem and the, the really kind of dangerous thing uh, that also goes on here, and this is basically why I think is what this modern technology is what he calls the supreme danger is because in this tendency for technology to make everything appear to us as standing reserve, as just something or set of things that we can use at our leisure for our own instrumental purposes, by making everything appear in that way, it also makes ourselves appear in that way. And so we come to see not only each other, like other people, as basically kind of objects that, that we can try to manipulate and use as we see fit. You know, even, even friends, right? Like even friends, we often are guilty of you know, trying to, like, a lot, oftentimes we want to, why do you want friends? Like, why do you want to have good friends? Some, often it's because, like, to, it helps you in certain ways. Like, you feel more secure. You feel appreciated. It boosts your ego. If someone attacks you, someone, you're going to have people to have your back. You know, there are these kind of, like, instrumental, selfish motivations to even, like, the most 
everyday, seemingly good, generous types of things. Like there are, there are, there's a kind of instrumental mentality to even basic things that you think are totally generous and about, you know, caring for other people. Um, and that is in part because we have a modern technological attitude in which it's very, very hard for us to see any, to see other, to see anything at all as other than something to be uh, kind of trained in a, in a sometimes a subconscious way for our own purposes, okay? Uh, but again, if you're the, the kind of uh, counterpoint or counterexample would be something like, uh, you know, think about like a pre-modern, or not necessarily modern, I mean, it, I was gonna say a kind of pre-modern kind of religious attitude uh, in which like every human being is a divine spark, you know? Like we have a hard time even kind of taking that seriously as kind of secular people. Um, but it is absolutely the case that, you know, uh, many people often, you know, this is often associated with religion. I don't think it necessarily has to be, but I think for all intents and purposes, religion is kind of one of the only kind of institutional structures in which this worldview can actually be maintained over time in which, you know, like if you're a saint or a priest or whatever, like a super, super kind of dedicated, um, religious type of person, you can very well access a kind of, uh, view towards other people where like you encounter someone on the street and they're not an object for you to use. They're like a genuine, like glowing mystery of divine value. You know, I think, I really do think that like some people have, are able to access that kind of, um, uh, perception of each other. And it's a fundamentally different type of experience. I mean, let me tell you a quick story on that point. I have my, uh, grandmother, um, I'm sorry, my grandfather, uh, his sisters were all nuns. And, uh, I rem I have these vivid memories, um, when I was very young of my grandfather's sisters coming to visit the house. Um, and it's one of my earliest memories and, you know, as psychoanalysis teaches, the, the, the memories you have that go, you know, very far back, you have them for, for certain reasons, right? And it's not always clear why, um, but typically, you know, powerful memories you have of your childhood, um, you know, you have them for some reason and, and it's often uh, useful to try and think through why you have those, um, why, why those particular experiences stand out from so, so long ago when everything else has been washed away by time. And so one of my earliest memories is my grandfather's sisters coming to visit every so often. They came every so often. Uh, so I have a kind of a few, you know, I remember this as a, as a somewhat irregular but recurring experience of the nuns uh, coming to, to speak with us. And what I remember is them, uh, when they would arrive, they would, and you know, the other thing is like, you know, memories are kind of like dreams. They're partially true but they're also partially fabricated. Like you make things up in your mind as you remember them and you don't necessarily know um, which is which parts are absolutely real and which parts you're kind of projecting or making up. Um, so the story I'm about to tell is, is an example of that. I, I'm gonna tell you it as, as honestly as I can, but I'm also aware that I'm probably um, making up parts of it, but this is just how I remember it. So the, the nuns would arrive and they would, um, they would say, uh, okay, well, come in, come in the living room or come in this room or whatever. Um, and you know, let's, let's have a chat. seems like a pretty normal thing. Right. Uh, but it wasn't, it was, it was like really profound because what they would do, and I'm sure they didn't think much of it, but I just remember that they would, they would sit down, like I would sit down on the couch. They would sit down on the other, on the other side, like looking straight at me, um, or, you know, pull up in a chair facing directly at me. So facing directly at me with like a really just soft, gentle smile. And they would ask me like how I'm doing and how have things been and what's been going on. But why, okay, so th that might sound super boring to you. You're probably prepared for a like a uh, funny, interesting story. Uh, but the reason that's not boring and the reason that's actually uh, super important and interesting is because I just remember being like kind of overwhelmed by the generosity of, of their attention. And it's because in normal life, in modern life today, it's actually extremely, extremely rare for another human being to genuinely just act, to ask you how you are, to ask you what's going on, and to have their absolute undivided attention 
where all they they genuinely just really care about um, what's been going on. They just want to hear from you. And you know, again, the reason so the reason that I bring up the story is because it actually relates to a few things that I'm talking about now that I think about. It. I've never actually made these connections, but now that I'm thinking about it, it has it it, it 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 connects with a few of the things I'm talking about. One is this idea of authenticity, uh, or you know, uh, disinterested sort of truth seeking, and and the, the the categorical kind of uniqueness. Um, of that that type of experience and the way that you can kind of feel it in this sort of undeniable way, um, you know, on the surface when I describe it, when I describe that story that I just described, it kind of sounds like there's nothing particularly uh, abnormal or, or interesting about it. Um, but but I but there's a reason that I remember it as as absolutely unique. Like I never I I rarely if ever felt that feeling of like someone just being so single mindedly. Uh, generously giving their attention to me. Um, and I really do think that there is something about religion and I don't have a, I don't have a well developed, uh, kind of, you know, uh, statement of this or philosophy of this, but there is something about religion that is, that is associated with that. Um, and I don't think you have to be religious necessarily to be able to cultivate that kind of attitude towards people. Um, uh, but basically, I mean, the hypothesis would be that modern instrumental rationality uh, and capitalism and secularism are kind of all intertwined, right? So uh, the same forces that unleash kind of explosive economic growth and, you know, the modern economy that we have today were also the same forces that obliterated the idea of, you know, unique universal human value apart from economic value, right? So it doesn't it kind of make, so doesn't it kind of make sense that uh, the, uh, some of the people who are most able today to actually access a, a view of the other person as, as having this kind of objectively valuable, uh, inherently intrinsically worthwhile um, kind of value outside of economic value. It makes sense that religious people would be uh, some of the uh, best suited to, to being able to still access that experience. Now, I think religion also goes off in a million bad directions because, precisely because of that, that unique power. Um, but my point is, so this all speaks to my point about how authenticity is a kind of absolutely radical and true. It's, it's a kind of feeling that you can't deny. Um, you feel it in terms of like writing. You feel it like when think, you know, you feel it in experience where, where someone is giving you their undivided attention in a really caring and generous way. Um, it announces itself in a, in a very clear way is the one thing. It's extremely intrinsically satisfying and rewarding, and it gives you some of the best kind of memories of your life some of the most powerful memories of your life, right? So these are all data points. I see this as all, you know, evidence. So I know some of you probably think I, I talk about a million different things in a, in a, in a weird, uh, you know, flow of sometimes hard to follow connections. Uh, but all of these things are, are related and they're all data points um, that are indicative of this kind of, some of these larger claims that I'm trying to make, okay? So um, in other words, when someone treats you as something other than standing reserve, it, in the modern world, it stands out as a kind of uh, a very rare and special type of experience. Okay. Uh, let's take a 10 minute break. Yeah. Cool. So why does all this matter? Why do I have you read some obscure German philosopher? Um, what is with these technical terms such as standing reserve and what, you know, what, what is the point of uh, working through uh, this kind of labyrinth of concepts and ideas. And it's because <coughs> Heidegger kind of thought that he was onto something uh, extremely important. And that's why, you know, he used this, this phrase of the supreme danger. Uh, and the reason that modern technology is what Heidegger calls the supreme danger. Justin, thank you. You're the man. There you go. <clears throat> the reason why modern technology is the supreme danger is not just because it, you know, makes things appear to us in this in this form of standing reserve, which is certainly, you know, uh, unfortunate, but it's not that's not yet, you know, you might think that's not so catastrophic. So what if we see all of natural resources as you know, and even, you know, other people as, um, as just useful reserves to use for whatever we might please. Why is that so bad? Well, 
I think the the real reason that that is not just bad, but you know, fundamentally catastrophic, is because it even prevents us from uh, seeing ourselves as any like the the self even as anything other than standing reserve. And I think that the the way to summarize kind of what's at the bottom of that is you know what it means is that modern technology seems to possibly lead to or you know uh it has a trajectory that appears to have at its end the possibility of a kind of fundamental and absolute kind of irreversible alienation from ourselves in other words i think heidegger basically thought that human that the human species was kind of on a track in which at a certain point perhaps even soon we could kind of go off the edge of being fundamentally irretrievable even to ourselves. Um, he seemed to kind of have a sense that there is a way of relating to the world um, that is fundamentally true uh, or truer, maybe we could say, uh, fundamentally healthier, fundamentally or, you know, more appropriate to, to our being um, that is perhaps being uh, increasingly lost to us. Um, and it has something to do with the way that modern technology basically distorts our most basic uh, view of where we even are and what we even are. Um, and so it's this idea of a pos you know, the possibility of an absolute and irreversible alienation from ourselves. Um, and I think the, the idea here, like why is that exactly or how, how does that work exactly? And this is why I think reveal this concept of revealing is, is so important and why, you know, his em his discussion of how technology changes the way we we see what even exists. The reason that's so important is because if you if if there are certain things that are real or that exist that you literally can't even access, you can't even see them as existing, but they're real and they're true and they're a necessary part of life and and see you know grappling with them and acknowledging them is basically an, a kind of hard requirement for living a full life, for living a true life, for living, you know, well-being, whatever you want to call it, um, self-actualization, whatever you want to call it. If there are certain things that we need to be open to or be aware of, and we're fundamentally unable to see that they even exist, then basically we could be on a uh, path of uh, catastrophic human suffering and destruction is, is kind of the implication. Um, but what's even worse is we might even know that we are falling down a path of increasing suffering and increasing destruction and increasing alienation from ourselves. We might even have a sense that that's happening and still not be able to do anything about it. If the problem is at a level that we have been barred from even being able to see. So that's why this, this, this emphasis on perception or revealing the way the technology shapes what we're even able to see, what what presents itself to us. That's why that's so important. Because if he's right, if Heidegger is right, that technology shapes what we're able to, what we're on the most basic level even able to grasp or see as existing, um, then we could very well be um, going down really disastrous paths individually, but also collectively um, in a way that is going to be uh, irreversible for us and I think you know I think we see some evidence that this is happening to be honest I mean I think like global I think global climate change is probably the most kind of visceral and kind of easy to process example of this where you know by most scientific accounts we are you know the the sum total of our current kind of uh, economic productive efforts and, and consumer efforts uh, you know, to live, just the way that human beings live on the planet today, basically call it capitalism, call it whatever you want, call it global, the nature of global civilization today um, appears to be directly headed to, you know, something that is literally kind of like the end of the world, basically, is what the implication is in the long run, right? That's at least the story of kind of contemporary climate science wisdom. Um, and yet we're literally unable to reverse course. I think that that, you know, how do you explain that? Everyone wants to reverse course. Everyone is terrified of climate change destroying, uh, you know, the species and 
and and perhaps even more. Everyone wants to kind of stop that. Uh, everyone would rather not do that, and yet it's like we're fundamentally incapable of doing it in some sense. You can only, I think, you can only really understand that with a with a really profound uh, understanding of how our own relationship to ourselves got fucked up really bad at some point. Okay, and I think that that's kind of what Heidegger is trying to 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 get at. And that's what I'm also very interested in because I think that I'm basically of the opinion that you know this kind of this supreme danger that Heidegger warns us about. You know that he wrote that was in the um, shoot I don't know when exactly it was written sometime in the mid 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 20th century. Um, I forget the year exactly, uh, but you know that was several decades ago. And I think basically the the warning you know what he what he was warning might come or was, was on its way to coming, the supreme danger that he was warning, I think it's actually coming to pass. And I think it's kind of a, one of the, it's a really useful way to try to kind of get into and understand a lot of the problems that we're facing today. So, okay. The question of course is what to do, if that is the case. So if, he, if Heidegger is right about the nature of modern technology, if there's some way in which our most basic perceptions and abilities to even see each other, see the world around us, as they as it really is or in its sort of you know uh it, it, our fundamental incapacity to let our environment reveal itself for what it is um if that is becoming kind of uh, irretrievably lost through the development of modern technology well then you know what the hell do we do well one thing that heidegger says that is uh interesting is that you know where dane you know, he cites the the poet holderlin and says, but where danger is, grows the saving power also. So Heidegger is also of the view that, you know, if we are in fact, if modern technology is in fact uh, leading to this kind of uh, profound and potentially catastrophic reckoning with who we even are and what we're even doing on this planet, that precisely because of that extreme danger, because the stakes are so high, um, that might itself be the necessary ticket to to the solution also in other words like maybe we need this kind of catastrophic we need these catastrophic stakes we need this supreme danger to actually uh it's through that that we might be able to unlock the actually correct way for human beings to live and to orient themselves uh precisely because the danger is so great i think that that's the idea of of this holderling quote Okay, so I'm gonna try to, I'm, I, I, I quite like that idea and I'm gonna try to kind of uh, take that seriously. So uh, how do we think our way out of this? Especially when, remember, I mean, one of the reasons that this is so difficult and, and tricky is that in some sense, you, it's almost like you can't think your way out of this because the whole problem is something deep, deeply embedded in our thinking. In the very nature of how we think there's something there's something screwy there's something that leads us to kind of screw ourselves over and alienate ourselves even with every repeated attempt to try to understand things okay so if that is the case then we have to get really clever uh about how we think uh because yes because if we don't then there's every reason to believe we're, we just dig ourselves uh, into the hole deeper and deeper. So what is the solution? I think, and again, I'm not, I haven't worked this out fully, but I think this difference between instrumental rationality and substantive rationality uh, might be one of the tickets out of this impasse. Um, because basically intelligence is, you know, <coughs> is instrumental rationality. Um, and so, uh, if you're just trying to solve problems through intelligence, you're probably going to be just replicating these kind of alienating dynamics. But if you're, but I do think that there is basically where I'm, where I'm going with this is I do think that there are ways of using intelligence that are non-instrumental and that do point the way out of this impasse. Uh, and it's very, very peculiar because it all points to obscure types of activity and behavior that seem insignificant or seem unimportant. Like for instance, when I told you that story about the nuns, 
you know, it's so trivial, right? On some in some sense, like what you like, you're probably thinking, who cares? Like what? What does it matter that you had some experience when you were young of nuns treating you very well and that it made you feel really good? Like why on earth does that matter? What effect does that have? But that that chain of reasoning of what effect does that have? That's instrumental rationality. That's your brain being hijacked by technology, basically by a technological orientation. So in other words, like the fact that I can remember something like someone giving me their undivided attention, that that would leave such uh, an, an incredible, powerful, positive impact on me. There's something real, there, there's something real there. That's evidence that there's something real going on there and that it, it, it is significant, that it does have an effect. And yet when we hear it, when we think about that story with our own kind of modern, regular, everyday attitude, it's like, who cares? Nothing happened. What if, you know, it's not instrumentally valuable. It's not, it's not instrumentally relatable to some larger set of consequences. And yet it's had this profound consequence on me. Um, so basically what I'm going to try to suggest through, you know, throughout the rest of the semester, really, but I'll, I'll try to uh, make it significantly more clear right now is that there is something very effective about using intelligence in a non-effective way almost. Like when you dedicate your intelligence to just trying to be honest or just trying to be truthful or just giving your undivided attention to someone that you love or care about for literally no reason whatsoever, to our kind of capitalist, <laughs> secular, like modern mentality, that's like a waste of time. But what I'm arguing is that actually it's a key to changing the world. Uh, and I really basically do believe that. And if, and, and I think you have to believe that if you buy this kind of larger critique of modernity in which the pro all of the problems that we suffer from are linked to us being kind of irretrievably locked into this kind of destructive instrumental relationship to everything, including ourselves. If you buy that kind of reading of, of the problem of modernity and capitalism or call it whatever you want, if you buy that, then it suddenly makes profound sense, I think, that the way out of these problems would be something like the non-instrumental application of intelligence. <laughs> this, is way, this is the way that I would summarize it. Okay, so let me try and kind of um, uh, back that out a little bit. Okay, To do that, we have to start by talking a little bit about what intelligence even is. Okay, because it's not at all obvious what intelligence is, just like information and communication. It's a word you kind of use very easily and you think you know what it is, but um, it, it, it bears unpacking. In a short kind of quotidian sense, it's basically just problem solving. It's the ability to uh, achieve goals in uh, a broad set of domains is what intelligence is. Um, one of the, you know, so machines can be intelligent, systems can be intelligent, human beings can be intelligent. Uh, and it basically just refers to the capacity for some agent or entity uh, to achieve some goal, okay? How well can it achieve that goal? Um, what's really important to recognize though is that intelligence by definition is relative to a given goal. So in, a, in, a, in some technical sense, intelligence does not actually come into play for the deciding of what one's final goals should be. Now that's pretty profound if you think about it. You know, if I ask you a question like, why do you live? What is your life's purpose? What is your ultimate value that drives everything you do in life? What is the, what is the ultimate meaning of, of your existence? Why are you even living? If I ask you this sort of question, intelligence actually can't answer that question in a technical sense. Because intelligence is the ability to solve, to solve a goal, to reach a goal, or solve a problem. Um, so it is by definition relative to some goal that has already been stated or given. The actual challenge of setting values or choosing goals from a potentially infinite set, intelligence proper does not actually give you that capacity, almost by definition. So that is going to be really useful and interesting for, for reasons that I hope will become clear. Um, but let's just talk a little bit more concretely about what exactly intelligence is. So to kind of fix your, to kind of fix ideas, you know, consider something like a Rubik's cube, right? Um, 
you know, you, this also goes back to kind of the examples that were given by uh, that guy, David Krakauer, in that podcast, which I thought was quite good, which I assigned. Um, you know, if you have a Rubik's Cube, you all know what that is, right? It's that multicolored uh, rainbow cube thing that with like several slices uh, that twist in every which way. And the goal is, you know, you mix it all up, the colors are all over the different squares. And the goal is to uh, align them so that all of one side is a consistent color, all of the other side is a consistent color. Every side is a consistent color, um, right? So uh, when you start off with the Rubik's Cube, it's absolute chaos, it's absolute multi-dimensional chaos. Um, and you know how quickly you can solve that puzzle, how quickly you can turn that multi-dimensional cube of chaos into order, um, that's, that's kind of a perfect example of a kind of intelligence task, right? So how quickly can you do that uh, is gonna be correlated with uh, your intelligence, okay? Sometimes it's a measure of your intelligence. Um, again, to kind of this also this is directly related to the map, to the example I gave you in the first seminar about what information is. When I said, you know, if you try to find my house in Southampton by randomly driving around, that's going to take you forever. If I give you a map, that's going to let you get there in five minutes. And the difference in those two time amounts is, in some sense, a measure of the information of the map, the information value or content of the map that I gave you. Okay. In other words, it's kind of like information is tightly related to intelligence. Like the, you could, you could almost say the map has a kind of intelligence value relatively, uh, you know, basically equivalent to the, uh, to the information content. But of course you wouldn't say that because the map is not a kind of dynamic acting entity, right? But tightly related, you can see that I think. Um, so similarly with the Rubik's cube, you know, you can solve one way to solve a Rubik's cube is by just spinning the damn thing around, uh, without paying any attention to it for like years upon years upon years, right? If you have a Rubik's cube, you can just do it randomly. You'll eventually solve it. Uh, it might take you, you know, 2000 years, but you could have, you would eventually come upon the, the, the goal um, that you're seeking if you just were completely random, right? If you're really smart, you can maybe do it in 20 minutes. Okay, That's, that, that means you're, you're intelligent. But okay, so here's, here's like a, a really crucial thing to see though. Um, what do we mean when we call someone stupid or we call something stupid? It's easy to see that intelligence means, you know, you're quicker than random. You're quicker. You would solve the Rubik's cube more quickly than if you did it just randomly, but you can actually be worse than random. Okay. You can be slower than random. And that is what we call stupidity. And that's really, that's you. That's really important to see. It's useful to see that, you know, stupidity is not just relatively low levels of intelligence it's like actively the opposite of intelligence and it's actually you know worse than you would get if you were just guessing okay so stupidity would be like if you were trying to solve a rubik's cube and your 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 tactic for your technique for trying to solve it was like just spinning one slice over and over again <clears throat> right you could do that literally for longer than 2000 years and never ever ever solve it okay um, okay, so that's basically, that's what, this is what intelligence is. Uh, and this is what a technical meaning for what we call stupidity. Okay, it's kind of that deviation from random, the, the random amount of time or efficiency that it would take to solve a problem. Uh, in humans, in the psychological literature, um, in, the, in, in the research on human intelligence, uh, it's sometimes referred to as G or kind of the general cognitive factor. Um, and it's measured by uh, IQ, okay? So IQ tests basically are a way of measuring this thing that we call G, which is general human intelligence. <clears throat> now, a few things to know that's, that's actually kind of important about human intelligence. Is, one thing is that um, it's actually an extremely well-documented trait um, of all of the kind of uh, aspects or traits of the human mind. Uh, intelligence is actually one of the best documented uh, and best kind of well-known, you know, <laughs> properly understood um, uh, traits. Uh, that's one thing that it's real. It's In other words, that's just to say that it's real. Um, and it varies uh, quite tremendously uh, between human beings. It is a fact that some people do have greater intelligence than other people. Uh, and they're born with it, with different levels of intelligence. You can change it. Uh, you can increase your IQ. Um, uh, but we're also born with different uh, baselines. Okay. So that it's, it's going to become very uh, important 
as we try to think about how technological changes affect us differently. Um, it also leads to the uh, peculiar phenomenon of time traveling aliens. How on earth could that be the case? Well, here's the thing, folks. People with greater intelligence than you, guess what? They can see farther into the future than you. And people who have less intelligence than you can't quite see as far as you can see. So what I find very interesting about that is intelligence differences in human beings actually do make it possible to say in some you know, limited sense that we do walk among aliens from the future. If I am smarter than you and we have a conversation, in some sense, in some sense you're interacting with someone who has been to the future relative to, to you. And I think the, re the reason I like this kind of provocative way of framing it as you know, a time traveling aliens is because it really stresses how, how significant and meaningful it is to talk about uh, different levels of intelligence. Um, and it also emphasizes the, the, the time aspect. So like someone with like, uh, you know, a Nobel prize winner who has an IQ of like 150 um, is so much smarter than I am that what, what that, what that means is that on any possible, ta on almost any possible task, they're going to be quicker than me. Okay. And that applies to things like the economy that applies to things like competition in the social world. Um, higher intelligence means getting there quicker than other people. Okay. And so in a competitive environment, like a capitalist society, um, intelligence matters tremendously. Okay. Um, so it's not just a little bit of a difference. It's like a massive difference, um, that makes us almost like aliens to each other when there's significant differences on this, right? Um, obviously within a particular boundary or within a particular sort of area of kind of the IQ distribution, um, you know, the differences are not necessarily that severe. Um, but if you get like a Nobel prize winner to talk with someone who is, um, at the very bottom of the IQ distribution, I mean, you are almost talking about fundamentally different types of, of, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're talking about almost like alien, alien differences. Okay, uh, so that's why I, I like that kind of provocation. Okay, so um, we'll see why I'm kind of laying out those factors of, of intelligence. Uh, here's a, a kind of diagrammatic model for those of you who are visual thinkers um, of what you know how, how intelligence functions. Uh, this is by uh, uh, this is from an article which is on the additional reading list if you're interested in it. Um, <laughs> by Hutt, I think the name is. Uh, and, and one thing that jumps out at you about this, well, I hope it's fairly obvious, right? Uh, so you have some agent that interacts with an environment, an agent does something to the environment. Um, and then if it's successful, gets some sort of reward. Uh, if it's unsuccessful, gets the opposite of a reward. Um, and that happens in a circular process where the, the action, each action is kind of updated based on the reward signal coming from the environment. Um, and there's also this layer of kind of observation where the entity is kind of uh, watching the situation and can make judgments about um, what's going on based on their observation, right? So this is just a simple model. This uh, is a way to kind of characterize machine intelligence, but also human intelligence. It's obvious for humans, right? Like when we're trying to solve a task, um, you know, we try something, if it works, we get a little hit of dopamine that feels good. It's successful, that's a reward. We do a little bit more of that thing that works if we do something and it leads us to uh, go down a, a, bad, a bad path that, that uh, doesn't succeed, then we, we realize, okay, that sucks. Um, we're kind of mentally punished for it. We update our actions and then we avoid that in the next stage, right? So it's a circular interaction with the environment, okay? Um, I hope that's fairly simple. And so what's useful about this is it's not anthropomorphic. There's no, in this model, there's nothing like a brain or anything like that. Uh, this can apply to machines also. Okay, so uh, that's just to kind of fix ideas. So, okay, 
Uh, one of the one of the things that stands out about this uh, slide should be the circular nature of intelligence. So intelligence is a process, um, and basically, when it's going well, um, there you know, the rewards inspire more action. Then the greater actions inspire more rewards. And so this is one of the reasons why, like, when you're doing something well, you know, if, if you play a sport, let's say, for those of you who play sports, or or you know, if you're a writer, for those of you who are writers, when you're really in the zone if you will, and you're doing what you know how to do really well, that's a process, that's an example of your intelligence functioning, you know, smoothly and effectively. Uh, you're getting constant updates, then you're getting, you know, you're, you're enjoying it and you're doing even better, you know, one move uh, leads to an even better next move. And that's like what people call kind of being in the zone. Um, and that's why sometimes like in, in, in sports or whatever, like many of us have examples where we're doing something that we, that we are applying our intelligence to and sometimes one good thing will then lead to another good thing, which will lead to three more like rapid fire good things. And you're just like, holy shit, man, I was awesome. I was in the zone, right? We have these sorts of, I, these like terms for um, when intelligence is like operating successfully in some sense, you can think about it. Um, but you also have examples of when this sort of goes down the tubes and you know, one bad thing leads to a bunch of other bad things, right? Uh, so like things like anxiety and depression are often kind of follow this type of, um, of dynamic, right? Like some, like maybe something bad happens in your life uh, and it makes you really upset. And so like you're really unproductive the next day, but since you're really unproductive, then um, there are a bunch of new tasks that you're not able to do. And so that makes you really anxious. And so you're anxious about the tasks you fail to do. So the next day you can't get out of bed because you're so upset about the tasks you didn't do the previous day. And then you're just, stuck in a rut of anxiety and depression and you can't get out of it. Um, so that's uh, kind of like the opposite of, uh, you know, intelligence functioning smoothly. Uh, that's like intelligence functioning in a kind of downward spiral. Of course, that's not intelligence proper, but my point is to make a, a connection between uh, intelligence as a circular process and these other types of processes that we experience that basically have a kind of circular structure, okay? Um, there is a technical term for this, um, and it is called positive feedback. Um, positive feedback is when uh, you know there is a system of any kind uh, where an entity is an interaction with an environment, and the environment is sending the entity a signal that leads it to you know increase or decrease, and then the entity manipulates the environment in a way that causes it to do the same thing, go in the same direction as uh, the environment made the uh, entity go in. Uh, in other words, here's an example, such as, um, you know, births and the population level. The more people there are, the more births there are. And then because the births produce more people, then there's gonna be even more people making even more births and this is why you know the growth of the population is basically an exponential process. Another example is um, bank runs or you know uh, economic collapses have basically a stru the structure of positive feedback, just like anxiety and depression. So the fear, if someone is afraid that they're not going to be able to withdraw money from a bank, they're going to go actually pull their money out of the bank as soon as they can because they're afraid they're not gonna be able to have it later. And then uh, the bank is actually going to be in serious trouble as it loses its reserves. And then the bank actually fails. And that, that makes people even more likely to be afraid that they're not gonna be able to withdraw their money. And so more people go and take their money out of the bank. Right? So that's a classic example of a positive feedback process, um, which again leads to exponential, uh, rapid exponential change. Uh, in this case, it's a bad form of change or a negative form of change, but don't let that confuse you. It's still positive feedback. Uh, positive feedback can be good or bad. Um, positive just refers to the fact that um, both sides of the dynamic process are kind of uh, complementing positively the change in the other one, okay? <clears throat> Final example is uh, something like diet and exercise and, and mood, right? So uh, 
if you're, you know, if you're in a rut and your life, you know, you're kind of miserable and uh, maybe you're eating really poorly and uh, perhaps you're, you're unhappy with how you look and feel, um, you know, that can be a kind of downward spiral as I already talked about, but there can also be an upward spiral out of that, which is like, you know, if, if you can, if you, that one morning you can just sort of get out of bed and you can get to the gym and you have a really good workout and you just feel pumped, right? You just, you have this new source of energy. You feel good about yourself. You have physical energy. You have kind of emotional energy. Um, and that me and because you have that little bit of positive energy you got from working out later in the day, someone says, Oh, Hey, you look very, you look very, uh, fit today. That makes you feel even better. Right. Um, and then you're more likely to work out the next day. Uh, and then you're more likely to get more compliments and it's this positive feedback, right? So, okay, these are all examples. I think you get the, you get the idea. The reason that this is important is because positive feedback is a process that leads to rapid change, um, significant systemic changes that can happen sometimes very suddenly. And that's because it has this multiplicative uh, kind of tendency or property. Um, So that's, some of these examples are really cool. Like this, like this one, for instance, like the point being that when, there are, when, you're, when you have situations where positive feedback is at play, uh, you can sh fix things really rapidly from relatively small alterations that multiply each other upward, okay? Um, but it also helps to explain like systemically bad phenomena where things can get really catastrophic really quickly uh, for the same exact reasons. Okay, that's, that, that's just wanted to kind of explain that concept and the reason it's important is because it's obviously uh well perhaps not obviously but in some sense at least visually you can see how intelligence itself has a kind of uh feedback structure right okay so there's also negative feedback uh which is basically the opposite it's when one side of the equation uh balances the other side of the equation okay uh so an example uh, one of the best examples is something like a thermostat, like what controls the temperature in a room, or um, like your own body's temperature, which is basically a thermostat, right? So here in just this example, um, you know, your body has a certain set point, like 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit is what it wants to be at at all times, and it tries to be at that at all times. Um, if, the, if your body rises in temperature, it has automatic mechanisms that tend to decrease the temperature back towards 98.6. Um, so change detected, corrective mechanism activated, goes back to 98.6, and then it turns off the temperature lowering mechanism once it's at 98.6. And if it goes you know, underneath 98.6, it turns on a mechanism to increase the temperature. Um, right, so these, what are these mechanisms? Things like sweating, right? If, you get, if you're getting really hot, you sweat to cool off. But once you're cooled off, you stop sweating. Right? So that's negative feedback. And so basically the reason this is important is because all systems that are stable, that persist over time, have some sort of properties of negative feedback. And some said negative feedback just means stability. Um, so that can happen sometimes very suddenly. And that's because it has this multiplicative uh, kind of tendency or property. Um, So that's, some of these examples are really cool. Like this, like this one, for instance, like the point being that when, there are, when, you're, when you have situations where positive feedback is at play, uh, you can sh fix things really rapidly from relatively small alterations that multiply each other upward, okay? Um, but it also helps to explain like systemically bad phenomena where things can get really catastrophic really quickly uh, for the same exact reasons. Okay, that's, that, that's, just wanted to kind of explain that concept and the reason it's important is because it's obviously uh well perhaps not obviously but in some sense at least visually you can see how intelligence itself has a kind of uh feedback structure right okay so there's also negative feedback uh which is basically the opposite it's when one side of the equation uh balances the other side of the equation okay uh so an example uh, one of the best examples is something like a thermostat, like what controls the temperature in a room, or um, like your own body's temperature, which is basically a thermostat, right? So here in just this example, um, you know, your body has a certain set point, like 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit is what it wants to be at at all times, and it tries to be at that at all times. Um, if 
the, if your body rises in temperature, it has automatic mechanisms that tend to decrease the temperature back towards 98.6. Um, so change detected, corrective mechanism activated, it goes back to 98.6, and then it turns off the temperature lowering mechanism once it's at 98.6. And if it goes, you know, underneath 98.6, it turns on a mechanism to increase the temperature. Um, right, so these, what are these mechanisms? Things like sweating, right? If, you get, if you're getting really hot, you sweat to cool off. But once you're cooled off, you stop sweating, right? So that's negative feedback. And so basically the reason this is important is because all systems that are stable, that persist over time, have some sort of properties of negative feedback. And some sort of negative feedback just means stability. Um, so, our, you know, our, our body temperature is just one example, but our bodies are filled with like these homeostatic uh, negative feedback systems. That's how we're able to survive in a kind of stable way. Could you imagine, and actually some, some bodily sicknesses are forms of, like when that negative feedback, when negative feedback processes stop working, uh, the results are often catastrophic. I mean, could you imagine, um, like if you got really hot and then you started sweating, uh, but the sweating didn't turn off once you cooled down and you were just sweating a lot and you never stopped sweating. Or imagine if the, you know, uh, you would, what, what would happen, right? You would like, you would run out of water and die, right? If you just, if sweating didn't turn off, um, you would die. Uh, so, Okay, so it's just important to understand that most of most things that exist stably over time have these kind of counterbalancing properties, and when they break, it basically means uh, the you know uh, instability or the collapse of, of that structure. Okay, um, finally, the last point on on negative versus positive feedback. It's important to kind of conceptualize how these things play out over time, right? So. Uh, and positive feedback is associated with you know what you could call converge. Uh, I'm sorry, divergent behavior uh, and exponential changes. So if a positive, what a positive feedback process takes place, it means things are going to either spiral upward quickly or they're going to spiral downward quickly. But it's unstable and it's exponential. That's what these curves represent, the change in the system over time. Whereas this is what I mean by stability. If you look at the change in the system of a negative feedback system over time. It goes up, it goes down, but it, it, it revolves around a center point, okay? Hope that's clear. So, Okay, um, you can probably have a sense of why I'm talking about these things because everything I've talked about, this is where we start to kind of uh, segue into this, this theme of, of modernity and acceleration because you know the only way you can explain something like this, this kind of dynamic in you know, human history where economic growth uh, kind of explodes right after around the, the Industrial Revolution this kind of uh, vitrogenous way, the only way you can explain this sort of thing is with processes of positive feedback. Okay, So um, that's why I'm giving you this background. And capitalism basically is this kind of uh, system uh, in which positive feedbacks uh, propel human history in this kind of catastroph catastrophically rapid way. Well, in some sense, it's obviously good. We get more goods and services. It's, it's hugely awesome in some obvious sense. Uh, but it's catastrophic in the sense of, remember what I said about positive feedback is generally, it's, a, it's an unstable process. It's a kind of, it, 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 uh, it's associated with instability, okay? So clearly whatever is making human society do this um, is an explosive, fundamentally unstable type of process. On the other hand, it's confusing because a capitalism is also very stable in the sense of, you know, absorbing all possible challengers like you know anti-capitalist protesters have never been able to like overthrow capitalism marxist revolutionaries even have never been able to overthrow capitalism um capitalism has a way of kind of uh defeating all possible challenges and that's a, so that's kind of negative feedback right it's able to squelch disruptions to the system 
Okay, so that's why I'm I'm kind of going over this these background concepts of what exactly feedback is and, and whatnot. Um, but basically, um, what I'm one place I'm trying to go with all this is to sh is to say that um, this problem of the supreme danger, what Heidegger calls the supreme danger, this possibility of modern technology kind of locking us into a dynamic in which we cannot escape, um, is I think that it has something to do with a kind of positive feedback. Um, like we use technology to get things for ourselves that makes us think in a certain way, which in turn helps us get use technology to get things for ourselves, which makes us think even more in that way. And that's why, that's another way of understanding why it's a supreme danger, because it's one of these things where like the more you do it, the harder it becomes to ever kind of step out of it. Okay, um, just to go back. So let's go a little bit back down to earth um, and talk about some of the concrete uh, applications of these sorts of ideas, okay? So um, I know I've been talking a lot about very abstract concepts. Uh, you might be kind of wondering, I know sometimes you probably are wondering like, uh, when is he gonna talk about the media? <laughs> uh, well, a good example is something like the concept of a spiral of silence. Um, all of these processes I'm talking about have very direct implications for the media. Um, because they affect what gets publicly communicated or what doesn't get publicly communicated. So this idea of the spiral of silence is basically a model of how there can be certain truths that nobody talks about that are actually systematically kind of repressed. Um, and how is that? Well, it's only through the process of positive feedback that you can understand that. And this, this diagram, which is from Kevin Kelly, which kind of illustrates visually how the, how the spiral of silence works, as you can see, it has a circular structure, just like positive feedback. Okay, so um, how is it possible that there can be certain truths which never get discussed? Or, you know, there can be things that people, there can be things that almost everyone believes and everyone says that they don't believe them. Okay, how does that happen? <clears throat> well, there's a perception of a popular idea. If you think everyone, um, here, I'll give you a very concrete example. Sorry, I'm actually cutting into our question time. I just talked too much, I'm very sorry. Um, but we are meeting tomorrow, so if you have questions as I asked you to have them, um, we will have, we're gonna have plenty of time for questions tomorrow. So please do, uh, just bring them in. And I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to abuse my authority and I'm gonna talk for the next five minutes until I let you go. Sorry about that. Um, I'll give you a concrete example of this um, that I think is like, we'll, we'll kind of bring this material and in, back into a very concrete kind of situation. Um, the question of political correctness today and the culture wars more generally is something I referred to in previous lectures and something I, I want to refer to throughout because it's, it gives a lot of good examples of what's at stake here. Um, so on the, if you're on the left, and I'm, I'm on the left, like I've been, an, I've been like a radical left activist for like a, several past like six years or whatever since Occupy Wall Street. That's kind of like where I'm coming from. That's my background. Um, if you're on the left, uh, the common idea on the left is that quote unquote political correctness is not a thing. That is, people still tell me this all the time. That the idea is that political correctness is a fabrication of the right wing. It's just a word. It's just an idea that the right wing has invented to dismiss, you know, the claims of um, of marginalized people um, uh, because right wing people don't want to care about marginalized people. Uh, the political correctness is just a myth. That is, that is still kind of uh, the, a dominant idea in activist, kind of left-wing activist circles, okay? Um, that is, uh, people have a sense that that is kind of what you, what you should think if you're like a good lefty person. Um, political correctness is not a real thing. Uh, so what happens, but there are people, there are people on the left who actually think political correctness is a real thing. And that it's not a right-wing myth. And that, in fact, uh, it's a problem. And that the left is too politically correct. There are lots of leftists who think the left is too politically correct. And I know this because they, they've emailed me. I've talked with a, a handful of them, okay? A lot of them, but I, I talk privately. But, no, but people on the left are not willing to talk about it. Because they're afraid if they say that they think political correctness is a problem, that they're going to get uh, kind of punished and maligned by other lefty people, okay? So what happens is... Um, they don't express what they think because they're afraid of being punished for it. Um, that makes it seem to everyone else that the idea is more popular than it is, okay? Um, and, that's, and then in the next cycle, people are even more afraid 
if you're on the left, you're even more afraid to say that you think political correctness is a problem. So I think that today we actually are in a situation where I would even say like a majority of people, um, a majority of people who identify as left wing in kind of the UK and the US kind of advanced liberal democracies, I would say more than half, and this is based in part on survey data and things like that that we have, more than half of the people on the left privately believe that uh, political correctness has gone too far and that it's now absurd and a lot of it is uh, insincere and they, and they disagree with it and they think it's actually really bad for public culture. Uh, but you almost never today hear people on the left saying that. And for the most part, people in the public culture who are on the left uh, still continue to say this idea that like the concept of political correctness is a myth. Uh, it's like made up by right-wing people, when in fact it's not. How do you explain this, 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 this is, and this is just one example. There are hundreds of other examples of how this kind of stuff operates in, in public media life. How do you explain the fact that um, most, most people in a group can think something and yet it's systematic, you know, the opposite is systematically being overreported uh, as the public dominant belief. You only understand it through this, posit this process of positive feedback uh, yeah, and that's why that's why this is that, that's why this is useful and interesting because uh, you might think that like if people have certain ideas, they're going to bubble up to the top. But it's not at all true that what gets represented in the media is actually what people mostly think. It's not at all true that the media is representative of what people think. There are these kind of uh, systematic feedback loops in which actually a minority opinion can get propelled to the dominant opinion in the media um, because of this positive feedback process is inherently explosive um, and, and disruptive in that sense. Okay, so that's just one example. Uh, things get even deeper and I, I will let you go and, or I'm, I'm, is that clock wrong? Am I, how am I doing? Yeah, okay, we got four minutes. Is that right? Is that where you go? Cool. Uh, Right, so in some sense, the issue, one of the issues at stake here is that capitalism itself is this kind of cybernetic positive feedback process. And that's why, that's one of the reasons why it's so, why it was able to sort of so transform our material living conditions, and mostly for the better, right? That's why like, you know, the idea of economic growth, the idea of people escaping poverty, this is all something that we owe, you know, on a mass, to the degree we have this on a mass scale, it's basically because of, the exponential positive feedbacks that are kind of baked into capitalism. Um, but it's also, I think we're gonna see uh, a source of the, the, the problems too. So this is a diagram that I drew, but this is a, basically just a visual representation of something right out of Marx. Uh, some of the first chapters of Marx's famous, you know, uh, Das Kapital. Uh, M stands for money, C stands for commodity, and M prime is basically money plus profit in some sense. Uh, so you start off with a little bit of money, you buy something, and then you resell it at a higher value. You're turning money into more money through a commodity. Well, guess what? That's already the basis of a positive feedback process. And that's how, uh, so the way that this connects back to what I was saying before about intelligence is guess what? The more intelligence you have, the more likely you're gonna, <laughs> you're gonna lock into this positive feedback process and you're gonna shoot to like profound and extraordinary wealth, right? So if you're someone like fucking Elon Musk, you could, you know, you could put Elon Musk in a desert with one dollar, and he would probably become richer than all of us within a year, right? Um, that's because of, that's because of positive feedback. You can use that money to make a little bit more money, and you're going to be able to do that in proportion to your kind of intelligence, in some sense. Okay, now that's good for making money, but here's something that's really important to, to notice and that I'll just, I'll leave on this thought. Capitalism is super good at rewarding intelligence, basically, um, with money. Capitalism is basically a kind of, uh, as I've said before, capitalism is itself an intelligent system and it, it kind of merges perfectly with human intelligence. So if you're highly intelligent, you can make millions of money, millions of dollars, and then make m even more dollars. You get the idea of positive feedback there. The pro the, a thing to note, though, is that remember what I said before about how intelligence is always relative to a goal. The more So another way of thinking about this is that intelligence is not the same as wisdom. And in fact, they're not even related. 
So wisdom is something like having judgment over the, the nature of one's final goals or the value of one's final goals. So you can be a super productive, uh, super rich capitalist skyrocketing to wealth on this kind of positive feedback process, but you can be doing it for very bad reasons. And you can be doing it in a way that is absolutely meaningless and that makes you miserable. And that leads you to cause extraordinary amounts of suffering and destruction in your own life and in other people's lives. Intelligence does not represent uh, the ability to be aware of that or to limit that, okay? And that in a nutshell is kind of what is so crazy and screwy about, about capitalism is that it's an intelligent system which selects for intelligence among humans and it rewards intelligence among humans, but it gives us the false impression that intelligence is an intrinsically valuable or that intelligence is intrinsically associated with having good goals or having good values or having a meaningful life or having any of these things. It's not at all related to those things necessarily. Uh, capitalism is kind of like, it gives you, it's like a substitute for ever having to have your own values. And that's really cool for normal people like us who are not Elon Musk and do not control the economy because we don't have IQs of 150 or whatever the fuck. It's useful for us because what it, this ultimately means people is that all of the people that are most powerful in kind of capitalist society are actually like, in some sense, the dumbest robots alive because they're just like locked into this uh, like system that is larger than them of which they are only kind of consistently fitting pawns. And that if we actually dedicate our intelligence resources, which in our, most of our normal cases are a little bit more modest, if we actually devote those intelligence resources to thinking about our values, and to thinking about things like substantive rationality and what is actually really important to us, what is actually necessary for a meaningful and valuable human life, how should we actually organize our communities on a, in a substantively rational way that is, that is consistent with our, our deepest beliefs and our feelings and our values. If we dedicate our intelligence to that, well, guess what? The people that are in control and have overwhelmingly dominant power, they're not doing that because they're on this kind of runaway explosive feedback process going to you know utter ultimate kind of like uh, catastrophe <laughs> probably okay so that is kind of that is where uh I'm, i think the action is in it's in it's in devoting our intelligence to these kinds of non-instrumental uh in, in a non-instrumental fashion and and the real kicker is that i believe that there are uh concrete ways in which we can spin out our own positive feedback processes that can shoot us towards um like radically and immediately uh, fulfilling and you know uh, kind of positively feedbacking uh, collective social processes, even just in small groups. Okay, I, I don't think that anyone has really thought this out as fully as they could, in in large part because technology and capitalism has so con has so sort of colonized what people are even able to think. But if we're able to think it, I think you know we could very fundamentally kind of change the the the, the future of humanity. So that's what I'm interested in. Thank you, everyone. I'll let you go. Thank you.